WCNC Charlotte. This is Flashpoint. Thanks for joining us here on Flashpoint. I'm Ben Thompson. Folks, what a difference a week makes. Last week, we told you the new North Carolina uh, map had survived its first legal battle. When we say the map, we're talking about the redistricting that had been uh, drawn up in recent weeks. And it looked like primaries were going to be held in March. But well, one week later, they've been delayed. The primary will now be on May 17th. It was supposed to be on March 8th. This impacts all elections, all races in the state, local, statewide, uh, Senate races, all of it. It's the latest in a string of drama filled days in North Carolina's highest courts. Joining us yet again to break it all down, Dr. Michael Bitzer of Catawba College. Uh, doctor, thanks for coming on again. My pleasure. Uh, I want to make sure I get this right. Um, I, I think to quote you um, from last week, quote, generally courts don't want to insert themselves. Now, <laughs> I've been in, I've been in interviewing you for about 15 years now, and, and, and because you you know these things better than most. Um, what happened this week? Well, the general got expanded to the basic concept of we will insert ourselves. <laughs> Right. Uh, Monday was a roller coaster ride, needless to say, of was candidate filing on or off in the morning. It was off right before it started at noon. By that evening, it was back on thanks to the Court of Appeals. And then Wednesday night, the state Supreme Court decided it wanted its fair share. It stepped in and basically ordered the primary to be moved from March to May, but more importantly, to have this trial, this process, play out over the next month. They asked for a January 11th deadline of rendering a decision. And anybody who looks at the courts knows that that is a very quick turnaround, considering that we also have the holidays coming up. So these things move fairly quickly. Never be surprised by a court action, but in general, they tended to say, we will let the process play out this time there appears to be an exception what it comes down to basically these new voting maps and um, the accusation is that Republicans have designed them to where they'll get about 10 of the state's 14 congressional seats um, possible supermajorities in the state house and state Senate despite what is a, a state that is is fairly evenly split right Correct. And, and this will be, I think, the heart of the controversy, this issue of partisan gerrymandering and how much can Republicans in the legislature tilt the maps to their advantage, in fact, even supermajority advantage, when it potentially could violate the state constitution's free elections clause. What does that say? Well, I think what we're going to have to wait and see is indeed the trial proceed, it play out. Who are the expert witnesses? Is the evidence on the side of those that are challenging the map to say these maps are traditionally outliers? When you look at a simulation of different types of maps, do they fall to the extremes or are they kind of more into what we would expect? We'll just have to wait and see what the experts say in the this trial, but the likelihood is once the trial is done in mid January, we will have an appeal back up to the state Supreme Court and ultimately they will have to decide if this is indeed partisan gerrymandering. And remember, there's a four three Democratic majority on the state Supreme Court. Understanding that you do not have the answer for this, I'm going to ask you anyway, what is the solution to this? I think we have to recognize first and foremost that redistricting is a partisan activity. It is the most partisan activity in American politics nowadays. And the issue of how the voters have sorted themselves, many of these precincts, 70% of them across North Carolina, vote for one party over the other at 60% or more. So a lot of this is already baked into the system. The question is, how do you design districts that could be competitive and give the opportunity for some kind of representation more so than a 10-4 when you are a 50-50 split state. So th th this all happened, and part of the reason this happened the way it did this week is because it was the start of filing, um, which is the two-week period where uh, a candidate for Senate or a candidate for city council or for, for, for state house 
announced they are in fact running and there's a two week period you got to do this. So about I think 1400 candidates managed to get in before this sort of halt was put to everything. What happens with them and then when does it start back up? So they will continue to be a candidate. Since the March primary was moved to May, everything will be shifted back. So we will have another opening window of candidate filing. Uh, the state board will announce specifically when that will be. But those 1,400 candidates will already be considered having filed for their respective uh, offices unless the maps change at that time. And if they change, particularly for state house or state senate districts, if those candidates no longer live in that district, they have to either file for a new district or remove their candidacy. Do you see this as an example of, wow, this is a, a functioning, thriving democracy and look how it all works and comes together? Or do you look at this as a person who studies this stuff as this is not the way it's supposed to be? The conclusion that I've come to is that this is the prime example of indeed our polarized politics. And yes, democracy can be messy, it can be ugly, it can be you know very much a we want to win at all costs dynamics. I think what unfortunately has occurred is that that mentality of we will win no matter what has really kind of taken over a lot of mindsets, unfortunately in our day and age. And so, yes, this is a partisan activity. Yes, this is political. But when people are looking at things and trying to design a system that will inherently protect one party over the other, no matter what the voters say, that is a questionable attribute of what we would describe as a functioning democracy. That was that, that was quite a way you just put that. Um, <laughs> and it was very detailed and, and very nuanced, but um, I think I got your point. All right, Dr. Bitzer, thanks for coming on, sharing your expertise. We always appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, more Flashpoint after this.